Hello, everyone, and welcome to Irenicast. We're going to do things a little differently this week. We originally had another episode planned, but after the shooting in Oregon, we felt like it was appropriate, if not necessary, to start this whole entire show with no segment, just a conversation about kind of how we feel about the situation. And um, But before we get into any of the issues that are important to us or any of the things that really stand out, in this particular tragedy, I think it's apropos that we start with acknowledging that this is a, a tragedy, that lives were lost and real people were affected. So I think we'll start, and uh, Mona's going to read the names of those whose lives were lost in this tragedy, and then we'll try to piece things together. But I think more than anything, this is our opportunity, and hopefully we're echoing some of the laments that you have in regards to this situation and what this situation brings up in all of our hearts. So. Mona, why don't you go ahead? Lucero Alcaraz, 19 years old. Trevin Taylor Anspach, 20 years old. Rebecca Ann Carnes, 18 years old. Quinn Glenn Cooper, 18 years old. Kim Saltmarch Dietz, 59 years old. Lucas Eibel, 18 years old. Jason Dale Johnson, 34 years old. Lawrence Levine, 67 years old. Serena Dawn Moore, 44 years old. Maybe we should just start with when you got the news or saw the update on your phone or whatever. What were your what were your initial reactions? Not again, which is a horrifying thing to have to think, right? Mm. That this is yet another story that we've seen the same narrative over and over and over and over in the last decade or two. <laughs> For, for me, I mean, normally I take news like this very personally and like even hearing those names and thinking about um, everybody involved, it normally hits me at a very visceral and personal level and I, I'm quick to grieve for people and think about it on that kind of a level, but I'm just, I don't know, I just got really angry this time. Like there's there's nothing else but anger for me. Um, yeah, I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little bit, but... I was looking on my Facebook um, news feed and someone had posted about it. And it's kind of triggering for me because I have I have some stuff in my past about gun violence. Um, I don't know if you two know. You're my brother-in-law and cousin. And I don't know if I've shared it with you. But when I was a little kid, my best friend across the street was the son of my mom's best friend. Um, this woman who she had known for a long time. And uh, on a Christmas, the dad that she had kicked out of her house actually came back home, shot the mom and then shot himself in front of the kids. And my family were the first people over there and like, you know, held her while she died and kicked the gun away and wiped the gun residue off of the walls. And I was only in first grade, but like my, my best friend had this happen. And I remember seeing like cop cars and bloody towels and stuff. And then it totally messed up his life. And then he actually got moved to Compton and got into some really bad stuff. And, um, yeah. So for me personally, when I see stuff like this, it, it's hard not to just get that triggered inside of me and, and think about like, I don't know, I personally just hate gun culture and I hate guns and think there are some basic things that can be done. So it's just hard not to be super angry when I see stuff like this now. I think this was the first time. And that's actually super sad is that we live in a society where there is a constant narrative. And I can say now, this time, you know, it happened so often that this time was different than the rest. But that's how I reacted. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Jeff? I think I'm pretty similar to where you're at, Mona. Almost, which was weird, almost like a, like a, oh, no, not again. But at the same time, like, 
not surprised. Almost, yeah. Almost like it, like it was a regular thing, and I, it, oh, you know what I mean. Like it was hard to, it was hard to put a finger on my initial reaction. And thank God for the AP app where I can just get the the news first before. I, I don't know what I would have done if I got the news first on Facebook from my feed because that's always colored with someone's immediate agenda which mm-hmm. brings in other issues and it's it, in that case it would have been harder for me to really delineate how I felt but just just the just the quick sentence of shooting and I'm just like oh man yeah i i know i f- i felt it's interesting alan that you say you have a, a a deep like emotional engagement with all these stories and i typically experience the opposite and i don't like that i experience this that I just process the information intellectually and I don't emotionally engage with it. And I think there's a real danger in that, that we just become accustomed to mm-hmm. news like this. And I, th- and for me, and maybe this isn't, maybe this isn't right for where you have been because you've already been doing this. But for me, it's very important to take the time to lament and grieve and not just feel bad for the situation. Like, so I can feel better about myself, but to allow it to motivate my actions and my words and hopefully take more action in the greater issue or society. You know, mm-hmm. I think when we, when we don't emotionally engage with this, we're really in danger of our, of our consciences being seared of our, of our ethical sense or our sense of justice or, or goodness being tarnished. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And the first place you can start if you want to, I don't know if this is, sounds morbid to you, but go look up Rebecca Carnes and see this girl and her family. And like these people are on Facebook. They're regular people like you and me. And you can like look at a picture of the victims and think about the fact that they are real human beings with real families and connections and hopes for the future. And that that's completely cut short. And like the rest of us are going to move on. But for those people and those families, like, there's a forever before and a forever after these events, you know? You know, and, and when you put a, f- a face and a name to this violence of the victims like R- Rebecca Carnes, um, and you read things like her family saying she was loving, compassionate, dedicated, and strong, that she was an, a very normal and good person, I think a lot of us are inclined to say, Oh, good thing that wasn't me or that could have been me. I'm also a normal person who my family loves, you know, but I think we have to go beyond the, oh, good thing it wasn't me impulse. Mm -hmm. We have to, we have to go beyond that. We can't just hunker down and protect our own butts. We have to do something more than just keep this violence out of our little circle that affects us personally. Anyway, and, that- and you know what? This is personally, I, I didn't even think of this, but my second thought, my first thought was I'm just pissed. But my second thought was, do I know any of the students? Because I was a youth pastor for seven years and I have uh, students that were my students all over like the Western United States in colleges. My, one of my immediate reactions was, do I know one of them? So I go through and I look through the names and like, mm. maybe that's why it's so visceral for me also. That's that's weird. I wonder if that's a, a youth pastor thing, but I do the same thing. Like anytime, yeah. especially with local news, but sometimes if I know that someone moved in that area, if it's, mm-hmm. I I'll always look like if it says anything about someone in their twenties or young or whatever, I immediately check to see. I didn't even think about that, that I did that until you just mentioned that. See, I, I don't, it's not a conscious thing for me either, but wow. I, I do have a former student at OS, you know, Oregon state university. So when I saw, college in Oregon shooting, I immediately thought like, I really hope it's not the person I know. And what's funny is that's a reflection Mona, of what you're talking about. I hope this doesn't affect my circle. And so like, we have a hard time thinking about outside of our circle, you know, like this is such a common occurrence that it's like, we, we are risk. We are used to risking our public. This is really sad, but like, we're not used to risking our family. We take steps to protect our family uh, the people that we know, our friends, and we're not used to like introducing risk there. But as a society, we're like, hey, we're big enough to where, of course, this stuff's going to happen to the rest of everybody, right? Like there's enough people in our country that someone somewhere is going to face tragedy. So we're, we're just like, take that as that's how the world has to be, is that yeah. there's that element for everyone else. 
I want to compare it to when people pray things like, oh, I'm going to pray this horrible storm doesn't hit you, my kid who I love, or hit me. But like by praying that, you're praying that it hits someone else, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is not – it's not a right prayer to pray. I don't know. But but that that metaphor breaks down because it's assuming that gun violence and aggression and horrific massacres are as – normal as the weather and that's absolutely the wrong way to think about this yeah Mm. i i don't know i i yes yes and no i think i don't know i i guess i I need to be more knowledgeable in psychology and brain development and stuff like that but it seems to me that in to use the storm example in that situation to pray please pass me by in the moment of all the stuff and craziness going on that's just kind of what we're going to do. I think the most yeah. important part for us is that how will we reflect on these things? And I think that's part of the reason why these situations are initially sad and then something else happens. And I don't know about you two, but for me, like anger and frustration starts to build because it quickly doesn't anymore become about what happened. It becomes about people's reflection and trying to like wedge it into whatever agenda or whatever they already have so it's that it's that after healthy reflection that i think that really is gross sometimes and really difficult to to maneuver through and then by the end of the the whole media storm or whatever you're kind of left with wait what happened like where are we i I don't know what i don't know what just happened and we forget all about the incident and all we remember is the rhetoric surrounded after it so for some people i i agree that maybe it's servicing their career pushing their agenda but i think for like most people it's just our cathartic, our cathartic way of dealing with these tragedies is like, if I can point my finger at something and say, that's the cause, it makes me feel better. Like I have more it, because this, this is like a senseless tragedy. Nobody should just go. No, no 59 year old to just go to a community college and get shot and not go home. And that night, you know, that should not happen. That doesn't fit our understanding of the world. And so when we can say, Oh, it's the fact that, there are guns in our society and we have a huge gun culture. That's the problem. Or we can say not enough people have guns. Everybody should have had a gun and that wouldn't have happened. Like if we can latch on to those small ideas, it restores a sense of rationality to the world for us. And it helps us deal with those emotions that are completely unsettling. True. Yeah. yeah I want to, I want to speak a little bit more to the, the normalcy though of these yeah, shootings. Can I read I, some statistics? I Can we go back to that for a sec? I, I think the rhetoric is really important to talk can, about too, but I, I have um, one if, if I can preempt yours, is that okay? sure? Yeah. Yeah. There's just one that like sticks out to me. The reason Mona can say not again and Jeff can feel the same thing and I can just get pissed is because in 2015 there have been 247 days and in our country, there were 238 mass shootings. So almost a mass shooting, which is four plus victims every single day of this year. Every yeah, day. That makes my stomach turn. That's, and a, reading, that's a daily. That, that's as often as, I don't know, you wake up. Yeah. Every day someone's mourning that their child has died. In a mass yeah. shooting. In a mass shooting. Yeah. So we're not talking accidental gun violence. We're not talking, you know, police fatalities. We're talking somebody premeditatively armed themselves and went into a public place and just shot everyone shot they could people. shot multiple people. And, and this, this is even more disconcerting in the entire world. We have more than twice the incidences than like all the other European countries combined European and like quote unquote first world. That's a horrible term, but it, we have we have more than twice the incidences, and this is only comparing 2009 to 2013, a very short window. So in that window, we had 227 fatalities from 38 rampage shootings, what they call rampage shootings. If you chart this, like our bar chart is so much higher and, and more than all of the other countries combined. Like what the hell is going on? I, I think it's due to the fact that we own more guns than the rest of the world. Like the, the America has 4%, 4.4% of the world's population. We are a th- very thin slice of the human pie, but we own almost half of the civilian guns in the world. Almost half. But there are other countries that own a lot of guns that don't have these mass shootings like this. Well, no, think about that. You take half of the sub- privately owned guns in the world and you give them to 4% of the population. 
I think that's an element. And I think I think for me, part of the problem is this is everyone's trying to find like you were talking about, Alan, before is everyone wants to find, you know, the one thing that that is solving all this. You know, when when tragedy happens, we try to find that one person responsible or that one issue responsible. And that's just not life. Like it's a series of things. It's a buildup of things. It's not it's not just the gun. I think that obviously that's a big part of it. But someone's still got to wield that gun. And what does it say about who we're allowing to have guns and then what does it say about how we deal with mental health in our society what does it say about like i think it's just this it's a layered issue that we we're not, admit that it's a complex yeah and we're not we're not we're not well and if we can't admit that this that anything is complex whether it's shootings or anything like how are we ever supposed to solve anything but it, but it's one thing to say like the human brain wants to look for some one easy solution like, it's one thing to recognize that and say, hey, I'm an easy target for bigger entities to appeal to my desire to have some sort of cathartic closure to this episode. Like, it's one thing to recognize that, but like, that doesn't necessarily mean that these issues, they don't matter. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I agree. Me. These bigger issues, they they do. And I it's easy to sway me because I feel that way. But the fact that like that, that stuff happens should definitely point to the, the fact that there's something wrong systemically. Yeah. And I don't, and I think gun control is an easy answer for a lot of people. Seriously, like if we just regulate the guns, this this kind of stuff won't happen. But I know people who own guns, and it is a. It, I, I don't like guns at all. They make me incredibly uncomfortable. Some people grow up with that. They they're hunters or whatever. Like I have a very good friend who's a hunter, and he owns guns, and he would never use that gun those guns to harm people. I, th- we're not talking about the quantum leap between owning a gun and being malicious with the gun. That That's a completely different, like I can own a knife. I can own, I own kitchen knives, but I'm not going to be malicious with the kitchen knives. Like, exactly. So I get really frustrated with gun control conversations mm. because it presumes that everyone who owns a gun is malicious. And that's, but, that's simply ridiculous. There is a connection there. I, I, I have read, you look and you see there are people around the world who have the opportunity to go on stabbing rampages or run people over with their cars or commit huge acts with regular household items, right? That stuff just doesn't happen at the level that gun guns do. Something about gun culture makes us sick. And this is no, my argument. Well, I, I do believe okay. that telling a public, you have the personal right to kill a human being if you feel threatened. And we are going to no. put in your hands, well, hold on, we are going to put in your hands the means to do it I think that that triggers, at least for a portion of our population, something very dark. And I think that it tells us the only solution in conflict is violence. Like, I I think that's what it tells us. And I think that you see that with guns and you don't see it with kitchen knives. I know everybody throws those memes out there. You know, oh, Cain killed Abel with a rock. It's not a rock problem. It's a heart problem. And and for me, I want to say – it's not that guns inherently the matter in the guns is evil. It's the gun culture around it. It's telling people it's, like well, you have you have the uh, inalienable right to kill someone else. No, no one's saying that. That's yeah, not an do. inalienable right. It I is. mean, it, it, our if justice you feel system, threatened, if you feel threatened, no, uh, no absolutely. It, I don't agree. What else is a gun I mean, used for to then kill people? Like to, personal to guns. Hunt- to okay. hunt and to protect your property. Sure, to, to protect your property. I can't believe I'm arguing on this side. No, no <laughs> it's, it's, it's fine. Okay, so wait, when you use a gun on, to protect on. your property, you're shooting just, people, right? Well, I mean, you don't have to kill someone to defend yourself. But, I mean, I was going to argue against you, and then I thought of the George Zim- Zimmerman case where that guy who shot a young teenage boy was let off because he felt threatened and he was acting yes. in self-defense. So you're right. There is an element of that. But I would argue the exact opposite. People who are malicious and who want power are attracted to guns because they're powerful, not yeah. because gun culture creates it. And that's I mean, why I said a portion of the population. I don't think every person with a gun is bad. I don't right. think so. But there's a there's probably a stronger link between like violent video games and like that's gun culture. Mess, on, online well Well, I'll, I'll tell you why. I wouldn't because say so. The, I would say it's violence games, culture. Because the video games that I've played hire gun companies to represent their guns in those games. There is a line that has been crossed between reality. Oh my God. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's very true. If you play any like war game, if you play any game that has all the specifications of weapons, what type of ammo they use, magazine clips, the way they sound, the way they feel when you play with them, 
gun companies are represent send representatives to game makers to make sure that it's accurate. Yeah, and so they're essentially who go on rampage. Yeah, they're sponsors. They get money for every game that you buy because they've allowed their oh product to be in their video game. That is an extension oh of gun culture. And so I for agree. me, gun culture is the problem. Just like cigarette culture was the problem, right? I, I think the whole thing that benefited the cigarette companies was creating a culture that appealed to people. And for me personally, I'm not saying take every gun away in America, but there is something wrong with the glorification of weaponry. With it's like the glorification the, exactly. of, of violence yes. and guns. Well, and I think that there's a middle ground between what both of you are saying. Like, there is a culture that definitely has that rhetoric. Like, to me, it's sickening that someone is so quick to say, well, just shoot him. Just kill him. Like, especially if they're robbing your house. Like, all right, take, you know, take my money, take my whatever. Like, fine. I don't care. Like, I'll replace it or whatever. Because the, the other side of it that, no, I don't think anyone ever talks about is... I haven't known someone directly, but I've known people who've known someone who shot a home intruder or whatever, and that affected them for the rest of their lives. Like, yeah. if you can shoot someone in your house, bad guy or not, and just be walk away and be like, I'm a hero and that's fine and I'm totally justifiable, there's something wrong with that person. Like, there's something seriously wrong with that person who can do it, even if they're in danger, even if that person was quote-unquote evil. Like, to kill anyone and be able to walk away with it, like... At least they have to turn off a part of their humanity. Oh At my least. gosh. Like, yes. Yeah. It, and there's, yeah. that's something wrong. Like that's a mental illness or whatever, or it's something that can build or, you know, I don't but, know. I'm, well, but, and then we have a police people. force that's militarized and attracts people like that who don't have qualms with shooting to kill in situations where it's unnecessary. Like that, I think that's why we've seen so much police brutality. And I wonder how much these things cross over to each other that like, police forces are recruiting people who get off on on using weapons and they're more prone to shoot to kill instead of shoot to maim or just disarm or exactly. disable because quite honestly like a personality like that is no different and i'm just gonna say it is no different from the personality of the guy that walks into a college and starts shooting everything one just has the right enemy and that's well, the problem trying, yeah they're trying to use that maybe that impulse for good and i appreciate that and there's so many peaceful peace-loving wonderful people on on police forces i'm not trying to say that all officers are like this so i just want to make that I, clear but i do I think friends. that we have a culture that attracts mm. hyper masculine violent like domineering overly powerful like personalities that are that where that violent impulse is cultivated almost so you know? i'd like to extend that a little bit like look there are people that are my close friends that are in law enforcement and I see what the law enforcement requires of them. And I'm not speaking out against law enforcement or arming them or whatever. Like I, I have a lot of respect for people who are in different departments. But we ask them to turn off a part of their humanity. Every time they have to defend an innocent person by killing someone who is threatening their lives, it affects them personally. And, and I've, I've seen it happen to people that I know intimately. So like we ask them to switch off a tiny part of their humanity. What I am trying to say is, Constantly using the rhetoric that every single human being in America should have a gun, should own a gun, should be prepared to shoot and kill, should be trained, should be, you know, ready to kill another person, switches off a part of our humanity as a society. And it makes us culturally ill. Like, I, I do believe that that's what happens. On but a, that's like a mass yes. um, desensitization to Absolutely. an ethic of love or like yeah. living in peace with people. That's, yeah. a, that's a fair argument. I think that's something. I mean, and, and the fact that Jeff and I have no emotional response to this story in like a yet again, maybe that's also displaying that, which terrifies me, you know, that I could also fall prey to this, that it, I wouldn't blink twice if I saw somebody get shot in a movie or, you know, if it's like quote unquote entertainment. I mean, I think it does start breaking down those walls of not being able to empathize properly. And that puts us in a really dangerous place. I think there's a lot of practical steps that can be taken. And you know what? The American public thinks that there's a lot of practical steps to, that, that can be taken. In 2013, they said 85% of our country believes background checks for private guns and gun show sales should be required. That's a huge portion of our public and those law, our laws don't reflect that. We don't require background checks and we don't require licenses at private sales. Like there's yeah. a huge gap between how it's we It's easier feel as a to get a gun than get a car license, yes. which is yeah. not intended to kill anybody. I mean, these cars still kill people, but still for the love of all there's, things holy. There's graphics I'm, about if you treated guns like cars. I mean, like there'd be 12 things that have to change. You'd have to license yeah. them, check them. 
you'd have to do all tra- training, pass tests, do all these things to get a gun. And even that so alone would be why, like, why don't we have any regulation? Because people are in government to protect guns and they get put in government because they run on that platform. And so they get paid yeah. to lobby. Yes. Yeah. Paid to lobby. Which there's very few people that are out to outlaw guns. Like it's yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. what bothers me the most is that and, and, and this is just a reflection of what bothers me most in our country anyway. It's always either or. You can never be in the middle. You can never say like you can never compromise your beliefs and it's I, I grew up in a, a church culture that was always like, you know, you're either hot or cold or, and if you're lukewarm, God's going to spit you out of his mouth and all, yeah. all this stuff. And I think that that is – I used to think that that was a reflection of just like this brand of Christianity, but I think that's a reflection of American culture. You know, it's all in. You go for it. These are the people that are praised, the ones that risk everything. And you know what? Those are the lucky ones. Everyone else who risks everything for something small is stupid. Like that's – it's – I don't know. It just bothers me so much. And I think that's part of the, the issue that I'm probably most passionate about is the way that people respond to this and everything that happens as a result of it. Like Alan, you mentioned that whole, you know, billboard meme picture of, you know, it's, it's it, Kane killed April with a rock or whatever. It's yeah, a but, sin issue. Exactly. But then yeah. if Kane had a gun, he would have killed the whole village. You know what I mean? Like it's still, yeah. it, yeah, it's, it's so bothersome to me. And then especially you add in this, this narrative now that people, I think it was just one person. I can't be for sure, for sure, but maybe a couple people were asked before they were shot if they were Christian or not. And now it's turning into this big martyr thing. Like it's adding to the, the whole martyrdom rhetoric in Christianity. And then politicians even like correlating getting a gun with an act of faith pisses me off beyond <laughs> belief like i cannot believe that someone would do that and then i cannot yeah. believe that someone that knows better would sit there and suck that in and be like oh yeah that's a good idea like yeah oh, just so that that's the thing that frustrates me as far as a christian level goes i can operate i created a 10 point plan and I, this is ridiculous in a conversation i once created a 10 point plan a couple months ago over uh how i think as a society we can affect gun control and gun violence but as a christian to see people at the same time glorifying standing up and saying, I am a Christian, being the second person. And this happened. And I, and I want to say, like, that is a very intense thing. And I don't want to speak badly about the people that stood up and said, my religion is Christianity. You want to shot like that's that's uh, that's hard. You know, that's hard to even hear as a Christian. But it's hard for me to see other Christians um, glorify being a martyr, standing up and claiming your faith, even when you know you're going to be shot. And at the very next breath, say everybody needs to have a gun. Because logically, the person who stands up and says, I am a Christian, cannot do that if they have a gun. You can't say it is morally amazing to stand up for your faith and die for your faith. And at the same time, you should kill for your faith. Those two things are completely irreconcilable. So the second person that stood up and said, I am a Christian, therefore, I'm going to shoot you in the face like that, that for them should be is more morally acceptable than standing up and saying you're a Christian and dying for your faith. You know what I mean? There's a disconnect between those two. Martyrdom is really complicated though. I think we should do a whole episode on it. It's very old tradition. Yes. Yeah. To really understand what it is. There's a lot of good arguments, by the way, in Christian early Christianity about against martyrdom and for martyrdom. That is a really complicated issue. Well, that's why that whole issue makes me mad when Christians are so quick to defend gun rights and violence and all that kind of stuff because they are, and then just quick to kill the bad guy which is bothersome because they believe in a literal hell like if you believe in a literal hell and your whole rhetoric and faith is based off the fact of you want to, people to avoid everything that is related to hell and yet at the same time you're just like oh well, they should die because they did something bad like that is super inconsistent i never thought about that i mean well, the I same think, thing I goes for the death penalty the right yeah. yeah. Same thing for, for the death penalty. Like we, you should, if you really do believe in the possibility of redemption for all people, you really should give people as many chances and keep their life open yeah. as long as possible and not yes. not end it. Um, but I I think though that I, I just want to say a quick note about martyrdom and and people saying you know and, and it, I mean there is I don't know if this is qu- true but there I've seen a lot of things about this latest Oregon shooting that the shooter targeted Christians in particular. And I don't know why, I don't know if that's true, but I hear a lot of rhetoric about persecution and that Christians want to claim that they have the same persecuted status as Christians in the, you know, the Nero Caesar period where they're being burned at the stake and fed to lions and, and not socially accepted because of their faith. And that's it. You cannot compare 
that kind of martyrdom that was a, a very politically real and dangerous situation to today. Like it, it, you're not being persecuted by the state today. So it's, it, I don't think you can compare it to the same degree, you know, and like to say, oh, this is a sign of the times or this is, you know, this is persecution against Christians because there's a war on Christianity and, you know, trying to tie all these pieces together in one like narrative. It doesn't, it doesn't work for me. And I think we need to look at deeper questions of this. Um, I, I really appreciate where Bernie Sanders was taking this conversation. I listened to an interview with him and he was talking about fundamentally, the first thing he said was we need better mental health care available in this country. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, I kind of think that it's more complicated than that because first we have to be able to identify mental illness. People who are mentally ill need to act, like ask for help or their communities need to ask for help. Exactly. Um, but that's we, why I think that's why I think that every school age child who's in high school or whatever needs to have a psych evaluation. We evaluate people for scoliosis and PE classes. We do evaluations for a lot of different things in our schools. But for some reason, mental health seems to just slip between the cracks until well, someone actually mental does mental health is criminalized. That's, that's because that's mental true. health has mental health was deregulated in the 80s and 90s and tons of public mental health centers were closed. And a yeah. lot of the patients were just turned out in the streets. That's why we have a really high homeless, mentally ill population in the like across the United States. Yeah. It's really quite sad that we've treated people who have mental illness as criminals, as people who don't deserve our attention or love uh, as a society. And so we we are seeing the effects of this down the line. But I, I want to say, though, Alan, I think that would only be helpful if we can do that in a way that treats those people with compassion. Absolutely. And I, I don't right. know how currently, culturally, we would not treat those people like pariahs. Yeah. And there's a, there's a notable... there would be a lot of abuse in that, too. You're right. There, there, there could be so much. Mm-hmm. But, but I think the intent, though... The vision of it is to get people help when they need care because Before a lot of kids – Before something bad happens. Yeah. Preventative well, because care. You know a what lot I mean? of people – yeah, exactly. A lot of people are acting out like this, especially young men t- typically tend to be rampage shooters. They're acting out of themselves trauma and abuse and and uh, unhealth and they need care you know they 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 don't need to be seen as monsters. They need care before it gets that bad. Um, but – I, I want to mention that if you're interested in this topic, though, there there is um, a, a lot of really interesting work done by a philosopher named Michael Foucault who talked about how mental health and sanity or insanity are culturally constructed categories. And I think this is a really, really yes. crucial point because we mm-hmm. collaboratively decide what's healthy and unhealthy. We've decided that it's mentally healthy to glorify violence but then we lock up people for possessing marijuana for 20 years. Like we have we have culturally decided where to draw those lines around sanity and insanity and not not necessarily the people who are either locked up or getting help are the people who need to be locked up or getting help, you know? Yeah. So we we have to think about this stuff more deeply than we have been. And we also jump we also jump to mental health too quickly sometimes. Like we we immediately go to I think it was John Oliver who said like we just start talking about mental health when there's gun violence instead of actually talking about like maybe it's because we're not I don't know I think we should federally mandate conflict resolution for school age children you know what I mean I, I think there are st- easy steps that we can take every kid should be schooled in the art of resolving conflict without violence that doesn't happen in America actually that's the, a great the idea it happens. And so these kids, maybe they're not even mentally ill. Maybe they walk in and shoot people because they do believe and they're taught that violence solves whatever problems they're dealing with. Uh, I think that that's a part of it. But I think kind of going back to that, what do we like the psyche valve of kids and stuff like that? I think it's more of training teachers and even parents that discipline is cannot be about behavior management. It has to be about character building. And I think that that's part of the problem is that the ones that are most going to enact the the worst case scenario of someone who is mentally healthy their warning signs are not anything but bad behavior that we also demonize within the thing we put them in the corner or even you know go way back with the dunce cap and all that kind of stuff where if we become so much about behavior management we're allowing the behavior to to distract us and to frustrate us instead of guide us in well what is this behavior and where is it coming from we never ask the why we only try to manage the what and you see that in churches too especially in churches i mean goodness there there is a there's a really um 
I'm, I'm very excited about this for what it is. There's, a, there's an up and coming field of trauma studies that looks at young childhood development and asks how much of behavior in like young kids, like preschoolers, is based on traumatic on trauma, on PTSD, like the kid who's throwing chairs, the kid who's acting out, the kid who can't sit still. A lot of times these are actually traumatic behaviors and not just that the kid is hyperactive or malicious. And there's there's a really interesting, um, This American Life that came out uh, about the, I think it was entitled the, Pre- the Preschool to Prison Pipeline. I mean, today we are we are treating even preschoolers like criminals. Like if they're acting out or if they're throwing things, they're punished and suspended and expelled from preschools yeah. because we're not looking deep enough to ask these kids. Maybe that kid just needs to be held for five minutes because it's not getting enough personal, like physical touch from its parents or, or something. You know, it's we label kids from a very early age as the bad kid. And that kid has that label on their forehead for the rest of their school career Absolutely. and into their life. But they often are ju- like kids, kids are not malicious. Like by and large, unless the kid is like a, a registered sociopath, they're not malicious. The trauma changes their brain, their neurological function. The trauma makes it impossible for them to express emotion or properly, like in, in socially con- acceptable mi- means. The trauma actually is, this is like brand new emerging research. The trauma is changing their brain and how the brain can self-regulate its own behaviors. So instead of punishing them for that, we can say, oh my God, like there's something else going on here. Yeah. I mean, one of the the common things is connect and redirect. So connect with what feeling is associated with that event and then redirect that feeling into a healthier way to express it because they can't that naturally that's not happening or they're not getting that example at home. And that's what I mean is all that is that behavior cannot be the only barometer in which we tell how someone is behaving. And I think that does worlds of difference in the long run. If we look at how are we, how are we constructing the world for our kids? And it can't, I was about to say it can't be an individualistic effort. I know I'm, going, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm hitting on this and I don't think it's going to solve all of our problems. But like we don't teach our communities. Our base level of community is the, is the schoolhouse, is the classroom. Like as little kids, that's our first foray into non-family public space. And I think taking kids who are having problems and just separating them from the community and dealing with them behind closed doors, it doesn't teach the rest of the kids that there are – people who need our support as a community. So I think teaching a whole classroom and and I'm not saying that you shouldn't separate and you shouldn't have individual education. I think that's important, but I think we should also be teaching at every level of child development that feelings are like this. We should talk about feelings as a group. We need to talk about what conflict resolution is like and have like a mandatory minimum hours. By the time a kid turns 18 in the United States, they have had as much education for themselves about conflict resolution as they do about, I don't even know the, (laughs) <laughs> the types of guns that they use when they play video games, you know? Yeah, because because uh, all of us act out like our, our grief and our angers and our frustrations, if we don't learn how to deal with them, we don't have any tools to deal with them. They will squirt out in weird, destructive ways often. That's just how human beings work. Mm-hmm. So I agree with you. Like we we have to equip people with tools to be able to resolve and to deal with shit before it, it deals with us, you know? Yeah. It's a very simple way of putting it, but that goes for everybody. I think if we're not all asking ourselves that question of how we deal with things, like we're going to get ourselves in trouble um, down the line. And and so that's, so this, this one thing about the conflict resolution and the psyche vows and all that kind of stuff. Those are a couple of points that I had came up when I drafted the 10 point thing, but like one, one of the most important things, I don't think we can have an honest conversation about this topic because research into gun violence is banned by our government. For the Center for Disease Control. Before we can even speak to each other on either side of this conversation, we have to have some sort. Our government needs to swallow a bitter pill and say any politician that prevents us from researching about gun violence is going to get the axe. Sorry. (laughs) I really agree. They're going to be fired. They're gone. They are not allowed to be in our government anymore because if you are preventing data from entering the conversation you just have an agenda and you do not care about public health or safety obama and, just called for that i think I, really? I i just saw a headline that he's asking congress to allow for research and yes um so that's that's 
that's a good step in the right direction, but we have to actually like demand that this stuff happens. Yes. We can't just be like, oh, it was said. Great. Like we're making progress. But we have to, as voters, find ways to organize and demand that that is followed through because you're absolutely right. We don't have data to base anything on. On on either side of, you know, on whatever side you are as far as like owning guns, whether you want to have restrictions or no restrictions, like there needs to be at least some way to be able to talk to each other. And we can't yeah. without it. That baffles me. Like, I, I don't know. What do you two think? Like, why? Why would, regardless of how you feel an issue, why would, uh, aside from it's, the fact that you know funny. the answer, why would you prevent the, the answer? Like, Lobbyists I, are so powerful. Like, our government's run by lobbyists. We're, we're kidding ourselves if we don't think so. It's also a deal, an issue of funding. I don't think, I think a certain segment blocks the research because they don't want the government to put its fingers in more pies, you know, to, to have its... To have a bigger, you have to hire people. You have to hire and contract people to actually do the research, to do this stuff, and that takes money. And so they can use the easy, easy argument of, oh, we can't spend money on this because we know that it's not a gun problem. It's a people problem. Yeah, but just you know? as much as money they're spending to block the spending of that money. Oh, I my mean, gosh. It's just, no, I know. It, it, but the research could be on the motivation aspect. It does, you know, social science can test stuff like that. That's a big thing that I don't understand from the conservative side is there always seems to be like a repression of knowledge. Like, if you... <laughs> You know what I mean? Like even within Christianity, it's like if you know too much, you're going to lead astray from that life is simple and it's black and white. And just uh, like, I don't know. I, I don't because even know. Education know. complicates things, right? And it's too easy to have people who feel they're educated push their agendas on people who don't have the the numbers or the education. I think there's I think there's like a background rhetoric there, a narrative that people have. All right. So I don't know. Clearly, we all have feelings and opinions about this and i think that part of what i don't know i don't remember mona if you said it offline or online but you talked about the idea of lament and lament is important to be able to have that moment where we feel where i think you know you you really experience the emotions of that moment but if it doesn't lead you into some place healthy if it doesn't lead you into some place practical to do something about it then it either gets bottled up or you know talking about the mental health issues it can come out in really ugly ways so i don't know as as we kind of close this out like what are some takeaways for you? Like maybe even on a personal level, like what, what can people do or even on a, a broader level, like what are some of the steps that we can take to hopefully desperately try to prevent stuff like this from happening in the future? If we can at all. That's a really good question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me, and this is stuff I've been reading about recently is what is our theology, our belief about the world, our belief about God, our belief about, you know, this life versus the next or whatever, what does our theology say to violence? Does it turn a shoulder to it and be like, well, it's just necessary. Well, it's just part of this ugly world that, you know, because we're all sinners. And so kind of in a way condoning mm. it. Or does our theology have something really powerfully prophetic to say to violence that that is not of God and God does not intend us to live this way? Mm. And I don't often get preachy, but I feel very deeply that we have allowed ideas about violence in the church and in religious communities and in our own thinking to become really, to become passe, that we don't have a good answer for it. We don't have a strong answer for it. And so that's the first thing I would call is our fundamental belief system and what we're saying and, and how we're treating violence. Do we really resist it? Do we really actually resist it? Or do we just accept it? That's a huge, huge difference yeah or do, or do we even unknowingly affirm it that's where it gets really scary right oh, like yeah. redemptive suffering you know and, and i think so a lot of this martyrdom rhetoric can be like you know well this is unfortunate that it happened but you know god's gonna bless these people in the next life and they they did something good and but we when we when we celebrate that in a weird icky way to me it feels icky to celebrate that but we we ignore the violent act itself we don't address it we don't look into it deeply we don't inquire and we don't lament and and the, so there is a fine line there for me i think that for me personally maybe this is where we disagree again on things like the atonement i think there are places re reacting to violence in a non-violent but very powerful way is the center of my theology. Like that's the center of how God has approached violence in the human world. For me, there are stories of martyrdom in church history where somebody could have avoided their martyrdom, but didn't because they had this idea that suffering redeemed them. And so it actually increased suffering in the world because they thought that somehow 
purified them or made them ready for this afterlife that was more glorious than not suffering. So I agree that it gets very icky and very sketchy at some level when we have these stories like that. Yeah. And I, and I also think that we need to be cultivating cultures that affirm life and celebrate life and peace. You know, when, when people of faith, uh, I guess I'm going to go a little bit Niebuhr with this, like Christ and culture. If you haven't read that, that's a really good work. But I think when people of faith acclimate so much to the culture around them and don't think about it critically, it's dangerous to our, our deeply held assumptions about life. Like when we, when we let our kids play violent video games, like what is that saying about our theology that, that can compartmentalize, oh, this fun little activity that has no bearing our, on our emotional and spiritual soul, that we can kind of divide ourselves in, in different little buckets and think that they, those buckets don't talk to each other or don't impact us deeply. And then it's just, quote unquote, for entertainment, violent movies, for example. Like, do you, do you really think about what you're doing when you watch something really violent and what it might be doing to you, you know? And, and we think that we're, we're untouchable. And I think that spirituality is more complicated than that. So I would just say like that, that's what is coming out of this for all of me. And I'm thinking about this deeply for myself and my language. Somebody spoke to that, like the metaphors we use, um, don't be like, Oh, I'm so mad at that person. I could kill him. Like that language, that, that thing that flows out of our soul would and we're not thinking about it. That's what's inside. That's what we've internalized. Um, and, and, and so and I think re- sensi- resensitizing ourselves, mm-hmm. resensitizing ourselves is a very spiritual act. Absolutely. And, and I think that uh, on an even bigger level, like you talked about theologically, the way we read violence in our texts, because our texts are as violent as anybody else's, if not more so in some cases. Yeah. Like the Old Testament, the way we read violence in church and for ourselves personally. I, I can't help but if, if I didn't have a critical thinking mind when I went to the Old Testament and read stuff, that inculcates violence inside of us. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like instead of looking at that critically and it normalizes with it, it, it normalizes it. Absolutely. Yeah. We have to resist and lament even our own texts. Yeah, we do. Even our own story of Isaac and Jacob. Like when's the last time you read that story and thought, oh, my God. Isaac must have been traumatized. His dad was trying to kill him in the yeah. name of God. What was that like for him? And we have to allow, and from 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 a uh, interpretive perspective, we have to allow for the possibility that the original people who read, who wrote, and read these texts looked at them as critically as we might. We have to allow the possibility that looking through the Book of Judges and others, they thought it was just as crazy as we do now, like sacrificing your son or. Uh, because that can be read as a thing of saying child sacrifice is completely wrong, right? You know what I mean? Like pe- people can look at some of these violent texts when they were originally written and possibly read them as if they were wrong, just not accepting uncritically everything they read. That, that's a real possibility that we don't um, engage very often. But for, for me personally, my takeaway, um, I mentioned it several times. and I'm not going to just delineate all of it. Uh, I was in a really heated Facebook conversation recently after um, the reporter and the cameraman were shot and uh, someone said, okay, I kind of agree with gun control, Alan. I'm sort of there with you, but what extent would you apply it to? And so I gave it a little bit of thought and actually wrote out 10 points of things that I would do if I had my druthers, I would have our society do these things. So I'll put it in the show notes or post it somehow so you can look at it and disagree with me or however you want to do that. Way to take action. Well, that's kind of action, right? Talking about it's kind of action. How about you, Jeff? What's your takeaway? You know, honestly, I don't, I don't know. Like, if if I'm just a hundred percent honest, like I have political views and I have theology views about how that works and what I think should happen and all that stuff. But honestly, I don't know. Like, personally, I don't, I don't like guns. I won't have them in the house. I've you know, I'm, I, I play video games and I've made specific standards for myself as far as which ones I'll participate in and which ones I don't. Like, I, I feel like the only thing I can do is is the space that I have. So uh, mm-hmm. I'm still somewhat connected to the youth ministry in our church as kind of the overseer. So I, I, I try to instill things there and call them out when I see them in a way that's loving. I'm trying to raise my daughter's right to have this view of the world that, that, that gravitates towards life first. I'm a part of a, a beautiful congregation and, and a group of people who have this life affirming way about them and in any way that I can to facilitate that or encourage that or grow that. But I don't know, like in in the bigger picture, honestly, if I'm honest, like maybe I'm just still in the lament phase, but I feel 
every time something like this happens, it just reminds me on how helpless I do feel and how I really have to work at having hope and having a, a, a small space where I see change in people really helps with that. So when I, when I see stuff like this, when I go to, to my congregation on Sunday morning and, and, and do the prayer and see and talk to people after and realize, wow, people are still getting, are, are being moved. Maybe, maybe that's the best thing. Maybe that's my, my advice is that if you're, if you're frustrated and you don't know what to do about the violence, about the, the rhetoric behind the violence when you go on your Facebook feed, is just, just take some time and find a really good person and realize, man, there's a lot more of these out there than you think. And I don't know, create a new norm. Because that's, maybe that's part of the problem too, is I feel like this is so normal and I don't like that. Yeah. And I, as you're talking about this, I'm thinking about how it's so culturally cheesy to like be about peace, right? If you see a peace symbol, like you automatically think hippies and Woodstock and like this. That's yeah. So sad. And, like they're naive and they don't know how the world works. Like, yeah. yes, exactly. It's like this antiquated like caricature, like, yeah, man, peace and love, you, you know, tweaker or whatever. I don't know. But what I mean to say is like, I like what both of you guys are saying, cultivating cultures of peace, loving and life affirmingness. And that peace building is not a passive activity. It's, it's very actually active. super hard. I and mean, it's, it's, very ag- it's aggressive. It's aggressive. Like look at people like Gandhi and, and Martin Luther King Jr. who their peacemaking was aggressive. It was in your face. It was confronting yeah. the realities of that evil, putting it right in front of them and letting them see it for what it is. And that is what we should be about. And it's, we're not this passive sit down and not do anything like the love and the peace that is there is aggressive and it is powerful. And it can- yeah. And I do want to say that it's actually super hard. If you are somebody who follows after Jesus or love and embrace and peace or your choice, as opposed to meeting violence with violence, it's super hard. And it's very costly. And uh, Dorothy Day, who is um, just an amazing woman, she, she was an amazing woman. Her, one of her quotes is, is my favorite of all time. She said, love is a harsh and dreadful thing to ask of us, but it is the only answer. And I completely agree. In our society where mass shootings are a daily occurrence, arming yourself and preparing to end someone else's life, for me, expect something and creates it with that expectation. Sometimes when we expect something to happen – we unwittingly add to the creation of that actually happening. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think that if you're going to choose a different path and you're going to be more prepared to love somebody, even in the face of violence, um, it's hard, but it's the only answer I can even think of having that makes life for me meaningful and makes sense. Yeah. And like we've talked about before, there's the creative element because to end violence without violence is really incredibly difficult and it takes finding a creative third way finding that other option that Mm -hmm. says you know i'm not gonna fight you i'm gonna i'm gonna sit down and serve people food or so you know it Mm -hmm. it takes a tremendous full body creativity to see other options and to act other options even at your own peril sometimes and that's the amazing tradition of nonviolent resistance that we have we have this available to us um we just have to figure out how to use it and if we all embrace that, I swear we can make a real difference. If everyone in our culture moves to embrace non-violence and to address these issues, those huge sweeping cultural changes will make a difference. We always say criminals will, you know, they'll get the guns or whatever. That's because there are guns to get. That's because we have all the guns in the world in our country. And if we move in a different direction, there is less there, there will be a decreasing chance of that kind of stuff happening. Because we as a system are saying, hey, the good of us all is better than the good of just my family. But but I will argue, though, that uh, just for a hair, a fraction of a time, that even if we take all the guns away, hypothetically, there will still pe- be people suffering in, in really horrific ways yes. that would be inclined to shoot people if they could. And so we need other cultural shifts also Absolutely. that offer care and support to people who need it. But, but, un- but until we move, that's true. That's really well said. And I think until we move out of my family above everyone else and move to a place of we all belong to each other until we can get there. None of these problems are going to none of these solutions will be applied. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we I don't know. We clearly don't have all the answers, but we certainly have, I think, a lot of really good ideas and uh, thoughts. But we know that we might have missed some stuff because really this episode was just kind of a more of a reaction. We just felt it was. Is important, and maybe even therapeutic for us to kind of get some stuff yeah. out and talk about yeah. these things. Uh, so if you feel the same way, please respond to the show notes at irenacast.com 
slash 31 and give us your thoughts. So we had originally planned to do some kind of wrap up for this episode that kind of, you know, does the whole wrap it up in a little bow and, and end on a nice note or an encouraging note or whatever. But I think the feeling so far is that there's more to be done. And to, to end this conversation in a neat way would be disingenuous to the conversation itself um, because it needs to continue. So that'll be it for us this week. I'm Jeff. I'm Mona. And I'm Alan.